for now, uh, business is normal. China's been buying kernels lately, mainly in Vietnam, of course. And it looks like Chinese demand, although it will not recover this year from the loss of imports during the early part of the year. Otherwise, it looks as if imports will be quite good. And the next big focus, of course, in China will be the imports and the demand during the Chinese New Year, which is in the first half of February 2021. So China does need to be watched. It Also, Chinese demand has a particular influence on the smaller and medium-sized factories in Vietnam. And it has quite an influence, even though China would be probably number four or possibly number five in the world in terms of markets, it does have a big influence on the sentiment in Vietnam, where most people buy their cashew kernels these days. In Europe, unfortunately in Europe, the number of cases has shot up again in the, the long expected second wave. And we're seeing huge number of cases with many countries now with strict lockdowns, various types of restrictions, travel restrictions, work from home recommendations if you can. The food business is continuing quite well. Um, we don't really know what the impact on the economies of a second lockdown will be. Remember during the, the first peak back in March, April time, we saw very strong demand for nuts in general and particularly very strong demand for cashew nuts at the retail level and probably I don't think we should expect much difference in the, the late part of 2020, but we will have to look at that again for 2021. Next time, by the way, we're going to look at the prospects for 2021, demand, coronavirus, crops, and so on. North America, again, sharp rise in cases and many people are saying that there will be a further rise in cases following the uh, the election both the campaigning and the celebrations and this varies from state to state nonetheless demand continues it is overall quite strong in the united states but demand in the us is much more fragmented much less predictable than it has been in europe europe has basically been a, a straight line up whereas the United States has been up and down and demand has varied from region to region and from sector to sector. And particularly if we look at the, the food service business, now cashews are not a huge factor in food service, but nonetheless, the food service has suffered hugely right across Europe, North America. And this has had an impact. And so this may mean that the demand for brokens and the demand for smaller nuts 450s or even some of the, the cheaper grades, SWs, spotted kernels and so on, that this demand may remain relatively muted for the coming months. We look on East Asia. Well, as we know, East Asia has managed the pandemic quite well. It's mainly under control. There are some restrictions, uh, but I would say demand and imports as you would expect. Demand in East Asia has been growing quite strong over the last three or four years. It has, we've seen this year, I suppose the impact of the pandemic on cashews, at least on cashew demand in East Asia, has been a switch away from India to Vietnam. So Vietnam has made further inroads this year in some of the East Asian markets. Interesting markets in East Asia, not particularly huge markets, but for growth, Thailand has been growing quite strongly. We've seen growth in smaller markets. We've seen more imports into, interestingly, into the Philippines, which is itself a, an importer, and demand in Japan has been quite strong. So relatively small consumers of cashews, but now showing good growth. And of course, markets with enormous potential in the longer term. So overall, not a huge change in the situation. Um, the worsening crisis in Europe could short term be positive for cashew demand but in the long term nobody's really sure of the economic consequences and nobody's really sure uh, of where we go next year and no one is really sure whether to cover forward how far to cover forward or not we'll talk about that in a moment as well 
Um, the discussions of a vaccine have given a boost to stock markets and given a, given a boost to business confidence generally, but there's still a long way to go, as everyone tells us, in terms of achieving the delivery and the use of a vaccine anywhere in the world. So let's have a look at what are the factors that we should be looking at between November, December and January, February, really in that period between the major Northern Hemisphere crops and the, and the new crop. So I think over the next month and a half for the rest of November and December, the focus is likely to be on demand in India, um, simply on the basis that most of the demand in other countries is already covered. So markets that buy forward, like the European market, the North American market, will be well covered. Demand for the holiday season in those countries was covered months ago and shipped weeks ago. Question will be, what will be the impact of this second widespread lockdown in the European Union? Will we get the same effect as we had in the spring? Will we see European buyers having to come back to market to top up? European imports are very, very strong this year, uh, following on from a very strong 2019. So you, you would expect that the market would remain relatively calm in Europe, but let's see. We wouldn't see the impact of that demand until probably January. The other aspect that really needs to be looked at, and we're seeing this spoken about a lot, is the RCN supply for Vietnam. We've been flagging this on this ACA I forum for months now, and it looks as if RCN supply, at least in Vietnam, is relatively tight, and that prices seem to be holding up. But it is moving up and down a little bit. It dropped off during October and has firmed slightly in the last couple of weeks. And the other factor which I've, I've alluded to, but which is very important to think about is the motivation for buyers to cover their kernels forward. And this is largely about value, which we'll talk about shortly, and it's about confidence. And those two factors, how do they play together to encourage or discourage major buyers of kernels from covering forward into next year? And then of course, the question is, if buyers do want to cover into next year, Will they find willing sellers? Will major processors, particularly in Vietnam, will they be interested to take short positions ahead of new crop at prices at or below $3 a pound for WW320s? And that remains to be seen. Looking at Jan, Feb, the emphasis will change a little bit. Um, the timing, of course, of the Cambodian and Vietnamese crops we're already beginning to see uh, brokers, and I, I have to question the motivation, I'm not really sure of it. We're already seeing brokers from Vietnam talking about the harvests being big and being early. Um, I'm not sure I see any evidence of that so far. Um, we'll then start to look at whether this incentive or disincentive to purchase kernels forward has actual traction and whether or not we see buyers coming in to take major forward positions. As I've mentioned, New Year in China, the level of demand, the ability of Vietnamese processors to supply it. And we'll start now to get into the discussion of new crops. So the, the new crop discussion naturally will depend on how this current crop season ends. So how much stock will be left? And, and bear in mind that the last two years, We've started the calendar year with relatively heavy stocks. We, in Tanzania, for two years in a row, we had unsold stocks. That's unlikely to be the case this year. It's much more likely that the Tanzanian crop will be well sold by the time we get to new crops in the Northern Hemisphere. It also seems to me likely that most of the stocks which have been held in bond in Vietnam and any stocks that remain in India will be tight by the time we get to the new crop. I'm assuming in that, that demand in China will be good. There's no reason to think otherwise coming up to new year. 
and I'm assuming that demand in the United States and Europe will remain healthy through the early part of next year. And I don't think that's any major doubt in that. I think that both will be the case. It could mean that when we get to new crop, particularly a West African new crop, that we'll be looking at the timing. When do the buyers come to the market? And at that moment, we should be looking at crops in Cambodia and the crop in Vietnam. It does look on the initial in indications that both can expect reasonably good crops. There's no reason to think of any major problem. I doubt if they'll have crops as good as last year. But we will certainly see Cambodia's harvest growing probably year on year for the next three years. So in the current year, Cambodia has already exported to the end of September 208,000 tons to Vietnam. 208,000 tons is about, let's say, 40, about 40 days processing capacity in Vietnam. So the growth of the crop in Cambodia allows Vietnamese buyers to come to West Africa that little bit later because they will have bought good quality raw nuts in Cambodia and they will have been able to buy it at volumes that we haven't previously seen. So we're in, into a what is normally a relatively quiet period of time, but there's many interesting questions arising and slowly the answers are coming forward, but focus on, particularly on demand. I, if I had to focus on two things, I would say, focus on demand in India. How does India emerge from Diwali? How are the stocks? How much RCN is, is there? How much RCN is needed? And focus on the initial arrival of the crops in Vietnam and in Cambodia. We look at price, and I'm going to look talk a little bit more about price today than I usually do. Well, I'm going to look first of all at 320s. So the chart you're looking at is a two-year, approximately two-year chart for WW320s FOB. Now I always take prices from good shippers. So what I try to do is I try to reflect the price from a, a good shipper with a good certification for about three months forward. So I don't reflect, you know, some of what I would regard as crazy prices that were talked about earlier this year as real. So you, you may argue with me that the bottom of the market was below 280 and you might be right, but I'm saying that's the best price I saw from a top packer for a forward position in the course of the year. That was, I would say, one of the things that was really available and not just a fiction from someone trying to get some business. If we look at the market, we can see that we're currently below the two-year average, obviously well below the two-year high, but not very far below the two-year average. The two-year average now after 2020 low prices is $3.15. That figure, as we'll see in a moment, if we take over a longer period, is, is much, much higher. And what I'm trying to get at here is, are 320s good value? Are they attractive for buyers? Or will they be more likely to wait? If we look at it, you've got to say that the downside on this is limited. I mean, the, the chances of this market testing back towards the 280 or below, I would say pretty limited at the moment. Um, demand is good, supply is tight, RCN is, is too expensive compared to the kernels prices, or as I would put it, kernels are too low compared to the RCN prices. And certainly some of what we've seen in the last three months really is that some of the earlier market stories about collapse in demand, people would not buy cashew kernels again, all of this has been proved to have been absolute nonsense. And what we've seen is I would say the market was undervalued for most of this year. It's still having trouble recovering, um, but I can, I can see a recovery not too far away. And we might get some indications on that by looking at a longer period. So th this chart is WW320s, the high, the low, and the average for a period 2008 to 2020. I've deliberately taken that because it covers the end of the financial crisis, which was the last 
major crisis that we saw in demand for cashew nuts. In 2009 and 2010, we had a, a fall away in demand. So you can see we work in a very volatile market. That's no secret, 2017, 525. But a good period of, and maybe take good note of that, a period of relative stability. Between 2012, as the market fell during 2012, into 2015 and just toward the end of 2016. So when you look at this chart, if you see the dotted line, so the dotted line joins the annual average price for 320s FOB. And you can see if it's toward the low, the market was falling during that year. And if, it, if it's higher, if it's, there's no example of it being toward the high, but if you look here where it's higher on the range, it means the market was rising during that year. So the question really is, in that context, how attractive are 320s? So I plugged in the, the five-year average price of 320s, which I think is a good indication of the impact of price on demand. And we know, first of all, that demand has been strong, particularly in the last three years, but also in the, in the previous two years. So the average price for 320s was in the high $3. It was 382 per pound FOB from a good processor. As you can see, we are literally miles below that right now. Well, we've been below that for two years, just slightly over two years, in fact. And um, at the same time, we also know that demand has been very strong for the past two years, particularly in Europe. Bear in mind, European imports last year were up by approximately 17%. That, that hasn't been seen for a long time. And they'll be up strongly again this year. On the basis of that, we should conclude 320s look quite attractive. And then we look at the two-year average price. Of course, the two-year average price is, we're now in November. So it includes these very low prices we've seen between February and October. Um, we're even below that. So you, you would conclude looking at that, that prices are attractive you might even conclude that they're very attractive. And I'm going to talk about this again when we come back in two weeks. I'm going to talk about a subject which we've called, called the, the gift of the new normal. In other words, the opportunity that this pandemic might offer to buyers and to processors. Conclusion, 320s look undervalued. Let's have a look at demand. So here I have taken three major markets, the three major consuming markets, India, about 40% of the market, North America and Europe, which combined themselves are somewhere approaching 40% of the market. Indeed, this year, the European market has grown again very strongly. And there is a chance in 2020 that Europe will match North American imports of cashew kernels for the first time ever. But let's look at demand. So in this chart, you have annual percentage growth or annual percentage decline in consumption. And this is based on actual consumption and actual imports, depending on the market. So if, for example, you have, let's say, 2019, you have European imports, EU imports, increased by 17%. So here you have a growth rate just under 17%. I think it was 16.49. United States, you saw modest growth in 2019. And India, 2019 was a relatively calm year, but it followed on from a very strong year. So these bars record growth. They're not the actual amount of imports, they're the growth in the market. And in general, I mean, if you look at that, what you see is you see over the period since 2020, in general terms, we've seen very good growth in cashew consumption. So let's try and relate that growth and the trends in growth to price. So as to try and give ourselves some clue as to how these low prices might influence demand next year, especially. So here you have the, the same two charts. So on top, you have demand, demand growth rates in the major consuming regions, India, North America, in Europe, and below you have the same price chart, 
average ranges of price, high, low, average price for the year, and a line joining all the averages together to give us a, let's say, a smooth trend as opposed to the, the jagged edge trend that we normally see on prices. When we look at this, we can see a number of factors. So let's look, first of all, it makes it easy if we look at the exceptions. So what are the exceptions? The exceptions are when we've seen declining markets, declining in imports in the United States, only in two years out of the, the full range. Declining imports in Europe in three years out of the full range. Now, overall, we've seen growth in both markets, but in these particular years, we saw declining imports. Why? Why did imports into Europe and into the United States decline in 2010, 2011, again in 2016 and 2018 for Europe? And if we try to relate that to price, we can see that the declines follow periods of high prices, but also of high volatility in prices. So volatility between 2008 and 2010 impacted demand in 2010 and 2011. Now I've deliberately chosen to take prices from 2008 and compared them to imports in 2010. Now this makes a lot of sense when you think about markets where modern retail rules. In other words, supermarkets in Europe, United States, Japan and other markets. In those markets, most buying is done forward. In some cases, it's done very far forward, up to a year forward, occasionally even further. Retail prices are set for long periods of time. These are not commodity markets. They don't respond in the way commodity markets do. India is a little bit different because India is much more a spot market. India is a market that where retail functions differently. So in India, you would tend to see that the re reaction to changes in price should be quicker than it would be at retail, at import level in the United States and Europe. So we're not talking about importers or commodity traders here, we're talking about retailers, roasters, their reaction when they buy forward, because that's the question we're trying to answer. Will they buy forward into 2021? Will they try and cover themselves a long way forward? So when we look at this, we see the reaction to price volatility differs between markets. And it, this is a, a factor. We know that volatility generally, so by volatility, I mean that prices go sharply up and then collapse. We've seen it 2010, 2011. We've seen it again, 2017, 2018, 2019. And you can argue that why did prices crash? They crashed because they never should have gone so high in the first place. That's one way you can express this. So should 320s have got to $5.25 a pound in 2017? No, probably not. It was born that high on the back of fear, speculation, greed, defaults of contract. How much volume was traded between $4.80 and $5.25? Probably very little. How much was traded in the crash back down? Again, probably very little. But one thing's for certain, that the volatility is not good for business. That's long established, and most people would agree with that. One only has to look at the prices 2012 to 2015, relatively stable prices. The high and the low were quite close together. The averages year to year were quite similar. And then look at the impact on demand, 2013, 2014, 2015. The highest growth for many, many years in the US, in India, and in Europe. If we look at periods of very volatile prices and particularly high volatile prices, we see a completely different story. The impact of the volatility tends to hit the year after. So we get high prices in 2017, imports in 2018 in Europe and in the United States are affected. Consumption in India is impacted in the same year because the Indian market, generally speaking, 
is a spot or a prompt market. So what you're buying today, you're pricing today, and is being consumed in the following weeks. Whereas in Europe, what may be bought today may not be consumed until next July. The product in the supermarket today may well have been purchased in the early part of 2019. So when we look at this relationship between price on the one hand, but also price volatility and the confidence that that undermines in the market and the fear it creates, we can come to certain basic conclusions. So we first of all have to recognize that different markets respond differently to high prices, low prices, and to volatility. Looking at this, we can see that India, with the exception of 2020, responds faster. So why is Indian demand down in 2020 at a time when other regions are very strong and at a time when prices are at remarkably low levels? Simply because the supply chain in India was disrupted. And like I said earlier about China, so we lost demand in China at the end of January and February due to trade restrictions related to the coronavirus or the pandemic as it became. In India, the lockdowns, the closure of factories, of markets, impacted on the use of cashew nuts. So the impact was seen immediately this year. People couldn't get the product to market. But also markets were closed. And also because India has such a diverse use of cashew nuts, that areas like manufacturing using cashew pieces were heavily impacted and processing was impacted. So India was the country that saw the greatest disruption to the supply chain of all the cashew countries. If we look at the US market, what we can see is that the US market responds to price. It responds quickly. So in the year following very high prices, US, I'm not saying US demand collapses, by no means does it collapse, but what happens is that the underlying growth slows. When that changes, when prices come back down again, for example, in 2012 and 2013, we see US demand recover strongly. Similarly, 2017, in reaction to forward prices, 2017, 2018, the US market started to respond in 2019, and partially as a result of the pandemic, has come very strong this year. The European market's a little bit different. The European market does respond to price naturally, as you, as you would expect, but it looks to me as if there are other trends in Europe, trends in the consumption of nuts, and foods generally that are supporting consumption of cashew nuts in particular, but all nuts. And this is where we're seeing very strong growth. 2019, 2020, this is remarkable. So I don't think in Europe that the growth in 2020, uh, this, this figure, by the way, will calm down over the last few months. I don't think Europe will finish up 10%. It'll finish up a little bit less than that this year. But at the same time, this is not a sign of a reaction to the pandemic. Shipments in the early part of the year were, but demand overall is likely to have been very strong anyway. And that's down to trends in vegetable protein, in snacking, in convenience, and a change in the products we eat. And that's really important because what we're looking at here is, on the one hand, the US market, quite a mature market, Yes, very strong trends in healthy foods, but relatively low underlying growth. The European market, on the other hand, is not quite a mature market in cashew terms. It's a growing market with very strong underlying trends. You could also see a situation where European imports of cashews will exceed US imports and possibly North American imports in total in the coming three to four years. Well, what, does, what do European buyers like, what do all buyers like, but particularly European buyers, is stability of price. So stability of price doesn't mean the same price every week or every day. Stability of price means that the market moves 
as it did back in 2012, 2013, 2014. So we need to be careful here when we look at our markets. We know that the cashew market is highly manipulated. We know that information is highly manipulated within the market. But by manipulating that information, by manipulating it, for example, to improve prices of RCN, by manipulating it perhaps to uncover processors or encourage processors to buy RCN, it may well have much more deep and significant long-term impact on the underlying demand for cash notes. So the idea that we work in this volatile market where information is essentially manipulated to serve a certain purpose can be very destructive. And we need to be careful with that. It's very easy to look in the warehouse and say, I've got you know, 2,000 tonnes of RCN, I'd like to sell it and start peddling that story. But don't forget the impact of that on the general market. And that's why we need more independent sources of good market information, things like the ACA database, for example. And we need more people who are prepared to analyze the market, taking into account the facts and not just the impact on their own books. And we, as as observers and participants need to be less tolerant of this kind of, of manipulative, cynical use of information. What can we conclude from this look at demand and price? We can conclude taking our first idea that cashew prices, 320 prices are attractive. We can conclude that we should expect further growth in demand in 2021. I think that we will see further growth in Europe, maybe not as spectacular as we saw in the first half of 2020, but we will see further growth. I think we'll see further growth in the US market. And I hope, and I would be fairly confident that Indian demand will return to a more normal level once the, the pandemic, or at least the management of the lockdowns uh, and any future lockdowns might occur is better. And what's the key thing to watch with the lockdowns is the exit strategy, how countries are going to manage their exit from lockdown and what impact that will have on demand generally for food products, but especially, obviously, we're all interested in cashews and that's what we want to look at. Let's have a look at uh, brokens, a big problem for many processors at the moment, uh, slow to move, low prices. And we'll have a look at just some of the, the trends over the years. So. So this chart is measuring, the blue line is measuring the difference. This is not a price chart. It's measuring the difference, or what traders sometimes call the spread, between whole grades, and in blue, fancy butts and splits, and in red, large white pieces. Again, product from top class processors, FOB. And when we look at it, we see that over the past 10 years or so, the, the differentials have not always moved in response to volatility in the price of 320s. So in fact, what we saw is this widening of the differential during the high prices of 2011, 2012. But the corollary of that, during the rise in prices of 2016 into 2017, we saw a narrowing of, of the differentials, and particularly narrowing of the differentials between the, the splits and butts, the white splits, our fancy splits, and the large white pieces. What we can say from this is after every major peak in the market, we see this difference revert. So if the difference between brokens and 320s gets smaller, that means the price of brokens is rising relative to the price of 320s, even though the price of 320s might be falling that during that period. So what's going on here? I think what we're seeing is that the use of brokens, and especially in response to the development of new products, but that the use of brokens is a little bit more volatile than the use of 320s. In other words, the ingredients market possibly the food service market, 
is more volatile. Let's say these buyers are less convinced about the value of using cashew nuts in their products than the traditional buyer of 320s who's been using them for 20 or more years in snack food products. And what we've seen is, first of all, a widening of the differentials due to semi-automated, semi-mechanized processing causing more brokens to be made. Broken prices fell, the differential widened, buyers became interested. But I think that the 2017, 2016-17, early 18 rise in prices really scared, particularly new users of brokens, and they, it scared them for two reasons. One, a product which they were buying around $2 a pound within eight months was $3. And then it was $3.50 at the top. That's very frightening. From a buyer's point of view, you've invested heavily in a new product. You look at that and you start to doubt whether you should be using cashews at all. Secondly, I think that the food safety record, particularly in relation to foreign matter, on a lot of the imports of pieces was poor. And many buyers felt that they weren't safe buying cashew pieces. So if they buy almond pieces or almonds, if they buy hazelnuts, in general, they can be fairly well assured that that product is low in foreign matter, that that product can enter their process safely. They will clean it, but it doesn't need a major clean and there won't be a major weight loss. But that doesn't apply in cashews. And particularly for new buyers who weren't aware that the, the differences between processors. So a number of them ended up buying products that were had stones, sticks, hair, even glass. And these, these are difficult things to find. And I think in many cases, they may well have decided to cut back on their usage. So you get, the, you get the triple effect. You get, number one, an increase in the supply of brokens due to mechanization. Now, that, that is coming under control because the machines have got better. But it's also impacted by the quality of RCN. So if the machines get better, but the quality of RCN post-harvest handling in particular, particularly drying, is poor, the chances of getting higher breakage increase again. Then you get price volatility, particularly illogical, overblown price volatility, like in, in mid-2017, and those buyers walk back. So we give them three reasons not to buy cashew pieces. Reason number one is price volatility. Reason number two is food safety, the record on food safety. Reason number three is, of course, contract fidelity during the high prices of 2017, 2018. And if I'm right, and if that confidence has been undermined, it's going to take a long time to rebuild it. And I think there is particularly an, a lesson there for African cashew processors on brokens. Focus on food safety, focus on foreign matter, focus on reliability. And I think, and I have evidence from particular processors this year, buyers will rise to that. Buyers will be interested if you can focus on those issues. You have to differentiate yourself. You have to talk about quality. You have to talk about making this product insofar as possible, ready to go into the process. No special cleaning necessary, no high risk of foreign matter and focus on those difficult things. Hair has been an issue, glass is always an issue, wood in the process, these are big, big issues. And I think these have had an impact on brokens. Unfortunately, although I do think the broken situation will improve in the course of next year, I think this is still, a, a long fix. This is going to take a long time to get right. I don't think we should be looking anytime soon toward this differential coming down where we like it to be, which is probably somewhere down here where it's a bit more reasonable. And this has an impact on processing. And of course, if it has an impact on processing, it has an impact on the value of raw cash notes. So this is a sector issue. Just promoting brokens as cheap will not fix this issue. 
promoting brokens for their quality and for their use in the process will. So what will determine prices in the next four months, to my mind? First of all, short term, look at the availability of RCN in Vietnam. Secondly, demand for Diwali in India and the impact that has on the need for further imports of RCN. I think India does need some more RCN, but how much will it need? When will it buy it? Do the prices from Tanzania work for Indian buyers? What will happen with Mozambique and how will the new crop open? Focus on India for that. The level of forward cover of kernel buyers in Europe and in the US, will they buy forward? Are they looking for lower levels? I think the, co the price we can agree is attractive for buyers. I think most buyers wouldn't disagree with us. Is the confidence there to make forward moves? And the next three weeks will be interesting for that. After that, you probably see a, a slowdown in buying. Look for the period just before Thanksgiving in the US, just before and just after Thanksgiving. After that, probably the market activity starts to slow down again. Chinese New Year demand, how will that impact on the remaining inventory of RCN and kernels in Vietnam? Will it be strong? Will it be likely to be better than last year? Or will it continue to grow? Then we come into the crop in Vietnam and Cambodia. Look for two things. Look for the timing and the size of the crop. And a real note of caution, don't believe everything you're told in terms of the size of the crop. Look at this very carefully. These two crops account for about something around about 9% of world production between them. But they have a huge impact on the sentiment. They have a huge impact on when Vietnamese processors come to West Africa to buy RCN. They have a huge impact on whether or not Vietnamese processors make forward sales and at what price they make forward sales. So the, the crop in Vietnam and Cambodia is a big factor on the sentiment in the market. And as we know only too well is what people believe is often much more important than the actual facts of the matter. So look for information there. Expect any day soon, if it hasn't already happened, expect to see reports from kernels brokers telling us that these crops will be big and they will be early. Similar pattern to last year. And finally, we should ask something we haven't come to so far. What would be the impact of lower prices on demand? And you would expect that that would be positive, in, particularly in India and particularly in North America. But in both cases, especially India, you have to view that in the context of the overall economic conditions. The damage done by the pandemic and the eventually the avail arrival of a vaccine and the availability of that vaccine. I would not be at all surprised, well, getting off my own topic of cashews and just talking about economics, I would not be at all surprised to see a very strong growth in demand, a very strong economic response to the arrival of a vaccine. It needs to be watched carefully because it may go beyond the realities, the economic conditions will not improve as quickly quickly as the arrival of a vaccine might suggest. So we are in a period of, as I always say, more questions than answers right now, but this does need to be watched very carefully. And those are the factors that I think will have a big impact on price, on demand, and eventually on how next year unfolds. So let's focus on one of the, the most important factors of the, the coming period, and that is the Southern Hemisphere crops. So we're looking at crops in Brazil, Tanzania, Mozambique, and Indonesia. And I'll give you a little bit of background on Brazil, and then our guests will give us some background and some commentary on Tanzania and Mozambique. Try and put it in some context. Between October and January, we get somewhere between 18 and 20% of the world crop. This arrives at the high point of global consumption in any given year. So it arrives at the period when we have major festivals in India, in North America, in Europe, followed by 
New Year, Chinese New Year in China and elsewhere. So this is the period of peak consumption between October and February. It's also the low point of global production. As you can see, with 18% in East Asia, 21% in India, 45% of the crops in West Africa, most production of cashews is between February and June. And these countries have very diverse approaches. Brazil is very different to Tanzania. Tanzania is very different to the way raw cashews are marketed in West Africa, which our guests will perhaps uh, explain to us a little bit. I'm going to tell you something about Brazil. And this year, we expect a better crop from Brazil. We have seen since 2009, I just thought I'd give you, a, a, let's say, a, a broader perspective on Brazilian production. So we have seen Brazil fall from one of the, the major producers with 300,000 tons way back in 2009 to a fairly modest producer today. In 2020, 21, from September through to January, a crop of around about 149,000 tons is forecast. And that's forecast to be a slight improvement on last year. This has happened because the, the hectares used for cashew nut production have essentially collapsed since 2008. A series of long series of damaging droughts, reduced yields caused cashew production to slump. And as we can see, there's little sign of any major recovery in that. And Brazil has some of the best and some of the most sophisticated uh, development systems for cashews in the world with trees, um, varieties, dwarf varieties, new varieties, cultivation methods, some plantations, a lot of smallholders. It had a lot of sophisticated processing plants that's been reduced because the availability of raw material has been reduced and its own domestic consumption. So the Brazilian cashew industry has fallen from being one of the stalwarts of the world back to production levels, which were previously seen way back in the 1980s. And there's no real sign of that changing in the short term. So we look at Brazil's share of the market, and this is the cashew kernels market. So back in 2009, Brazil had about 12% of the cashew kernels market. 12% of world production, which is quite interesting compared to 2019, where it was only 4%, a little under 4%, in fact. Not hugely surprising. I mean, Vietnam and Cambodia actually dropped in that period too. India's share dropped. There was this shift to West Africa was there. But this was not the, the reason in Brazil. Brazil had difficulties in production and it's lost its market share. And there really is at this moment in time, no, no reason to believe that that will change. So a better crop in Brazil coming up, almost all of it will be processed and exported, but there is a, a healthy consumption in Brazil itself. Better, but no sign of any, any at this moment in time, no sign of any real resurgence in the Brazilian cashew production. So I'll pass back to Ernest, who will introduce us to our two guests. Very welcome to experts on their own production in their own countries. And for me, I'll just for now like to say thank you very much indeed for your attention. And we'll come back to questions a little bit later. Thank you very much, Jim. We'll be taking the Q&A after uh, we've had the inputs uh, from Tanzania and Mozambique. So we'll continue the Southern Hemisphere discussion by uh, inviting uh, Madame Else Marie Salema of uh, Incaju, uh, who will give us uh, the information on what is going on in uh, Mozambique now uh, regarding the production of the cr crop and uh, the trade of it and uh, also whether there are any uh, sector specific policies that are being implemented or any specific activities that we should take note of 
uh, as we begin to receive their crop uh, into the uh, global production here. So, uh, Madam uh, Sali Salemina, uh, please, if you are ready, you can uh, activate your mic and your video. Hello, Madam. Uh, yes, I'm here. Please, you are live now, and uh, please, you can go ahead and speak. And then uh, it let us know what is happening uh, in Tanzania, how is the crop developing, and uh, sorry, in Mozambique, how is the crop developing, and uh, what specific issues we need to take note of uh, as we look at uh, the current situation with COVID and also generally with production in the Southern Hemisphere. So please go ahead. Please, you can also bring your camera, uh, lower your laptop a bit so that we can see your face beautiful. So please go ahead, madam. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Are you hear me? Yes, good morning. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I, I would like to correct the names. Is Maria Suleiman. It's not Elsa Maria, it's another person. Okay, very good. So Maria Suleimana, thank you very much, Madam. Hey, thank you. So thank you for the opportunity. Oh, sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to, to participate the, in this session. So say about the Mozambique, uh, in the, over the last three years, we have seen an increase uh, of 10,000 uh, in cash and uh, marketing. However, we also observed uh, a re reduction in uh, about uh, 50 cent in the uh, selling package. Uh, we have moved from 130,000 ton to 100 to 40. So for this session, it's expected to uh, trade 150 